Matthew at the Ballroom. Written by Abby Ailes and published by Starfall Publications. Bells of the Ball Book 6, available on our website and on Amazon. Save more with our bundles. Enjoy. Chapter 1 Abigail Brown wiped the sweat from her brow with the back of her hand, careful not to smear flour on her face. The kitchen buzzed with activity, a hive of servants darting to and fro. The air hung thick with the aroma of roasting meats and simmering sauces. She returned her attention to the pastry dough before her, kneading it with practiced precision. Her fingers worked quickly, folding and pressing the butter into the flour. The rhythmic motion allowed her mind to wander, but she caught herself. No distractions. Not here. Miss Brown, them potatoes need peeling. Mrs Winters, the portly head cook, barked from across the kitchen. Abigail glanced up, careful to keep her expression neutral. Right away, Mrs Winters. She set aside the dough and moved to the sink, where a mountain of potatoes awaited. As she picked up the first spud, her keen ears caught snippets of conversation around her. Did you hear about Lord Ashbury? A scullery maid whispered to her companion. Hush now, the other girl said, casting a furtive glance toward Abigail. Abigail kept her eyes on her task, peeling the potatoes with swift, efficient strokes. Her mind filed away the tidbit of gossip for later. A loud crash echoed through the kitchen. Abigail's head snapped up to see a young footman, red-faced and stammering, surrounded by shards of what was once a fine china platter. Mrs Winters descended upon the poor lad like a thundercloud. You clumsy oaf! That was part of the mistress's best set. Abigail watched the scene unfold, her hands never pausing in their work. She'd seen footmen dismissed for less. As Mrs Winters continued her tirade, Abigail caught the eye of Sarah, one of the kitchen maids. They shared a brief, knowing look before returning to their tasks. The kitchen door swung open and Mr Phelps, the butler, strode in. His presence brought a momentary hush to the bustling room. The mistress will be hosting an impromptu dinner party this evening, he announced, his voice clipped and precise. We are to prepare for six additional guests. A collective groan rose from the staff, quickly stifled under Mr Phelps' stern gaze. Abigail, he addressed her directly, the mistress specifically requested your apple tart for dessert. Abigail nodded, suppressing a small surge of pride. Of course, Mr Phelps, I'll see to it right away. As the butler left, the kitchen erupted into a frenzy of renewed activity. Abigail finished the last potato and moved to wash her hands, mind already racing through the steps needed to prepare her signature dish. She reached for the apples. Her hands were moving with practised ease as she sliced the apples, and her knife was making quick work of the crisp fruit. The pastry dough had already rested, and she began forming it as required. She sensed someone approach and glanced up to see Sarah, one of the younger kitchen maids, sidle up beside her. Need a hand, Abigail? Sarah asked, already reaching for an apple. Abigail nodded, sliding the bowl of fruit between them. Thank you, Sarah. If you could slice these thinly, I'd appreciate it. Sarah beamed, clearly pleased to be working alongside one of the cooks. Of course, I've always wanted to learn how you make your tarts. They're simply divine. Abigail kept her eyes on her work, offering only a small smile in response. She could feel Sarah's eagerness to chat radiating off her like heat from an oven. So, Miss Abigail... Where did you learn to cook like this? Sarah pressed, her knife moving slower than Abigail's as she spoke. Oh, here and there, Abigail replied vaguely. One picks things up over the years. Sarah nodded, undeterred. And where were you before you came here? I bet you worked in all sorts of grand houses. Abigail's knife paused for a fraction of a second before resuming its steady rhythm. Nothing quite so grand, I'm afraid. Just modest establishments. Well, I think you're brilliant, Abigail, Sarah said warmly. Abigail winced at the sound of her name, 
a jolt of regret running through her. She'd been careless, allowing her real name to be used in this household. It was a mistake she couldn't afford to make again. That's kind of you to say, Abigail murmured, keeping her tone neutral. She reached for another apple, her mind racing to change the subject. Have you heard about the extra guests for dinner? Mr. Phelps seemed quite put out. Sarah latched on to the new topic with enthusiasm, launching into a stream of speculation about the unexpected dinner guests. Abigail listened with half an ear, offering non-committal hums at appropriate intervals. As Sarah chatted on, Abigail's thoughts drifted to the task ahead. She'd need to be extra vigilant tonight, with so many guests in attendance. There was bound to be interest in conversation, snippets of gossip that her employer would find valuable. Lady Ashbury's dress was positively scandalous, a footman whispered as he rushed past with a tray of soup bowls. Cut so low, you could see her navel. Abigail filed the information away, her face betraying nothing as she carefully arranged apple slices in a perfect spiral. Later, as she handed off the finished tart to a waiting kitchen maid to be plated, she overheard two maids gossiping in hushed tones. Did you see how Lord Pembroke kept staring at Miss Fairfax? His wife looked ready to murder them both? Well, I heard Miss Fairfax has been seen leaving his townhouse at all hours, the other maid said with a knowing smirk. Abigail's fingers twitched slightly as she wiped down her workstation, committing the exchange to memory. It seemed trivial, but she knew better than to dismiss any information, no matter how insignificant it appeared. As the evening wore on, more tidbits reached her ears. The Duke of Marlborough had lost a fortune at the gaming tables. Young Mr Hartley was rumoured to be courting an American heiress. Lady Windermere's new maid was suspected of being a French spy. Abigail absorbed it all, her face a mask of concentration as she went about her duties. To anyone watching, she appeared wholly focused on her culinary tasks. But beneath the surface, her mind was a whirlwind, cataloguing and connecting each piece of gossip. She knew her employer would be eager for every morsel of information, regardless of its apparent importance. In her experience, the most seemingly trivial bit of social scandal could prove invaluable in the right hands. Abigail's muscles ached as she continued her work in the kitchen. The clamour of the dinner party had long since faded, replaced by the quiet rustling of servants cleaning up and preparing for the next day. She glanced at the clock on the wall, its hands creeping past midnight. The kitchen, once a hive of activity, now felt cavernous and empty. Abigail wiped down the last of the copper pots, her movements practised and efficient. She heard the shuffling of feet behind her and turned to see Sarah, the young kitchen maid, stifling a yawn. Sarah, why don't you head up to bed? Abigail suggested, keeping her voice low. I can black the oven. Sarah's eyes widened. Are you sure, Miss Brown? It's such a messy job. Abigail nodded, offering a small smile. Of course, you've worked hard today. Get some rest. Thank you, Miss Brown, Sarah beamed, already untying her apron. You're ever so kind. Abigail watched as the girl scurried out of the kitchen, her footsteps fading up the narrow servant's staircase. She turned her attention to the oven, gathering the blacking and brushes. As she worked, Abigail kept her ears pricked for any sound of movement in the house. One by one, she heard the other servants retire for the night. The butler's measured tread, the housemaid's light steps, the cook's heavy footfalls. Still, Abigail worked on making a show of her diligence. She scrubbed at the oven with vigour even as her arms protested the movement. The acrid smell of the blacking filled her nostrils but she barely noticed it anymore. Finally, the last of the servants trudged off to bed. Abigail paused, listening intently. The house had fallen silent, save for the occasional creak of settling wood. Abigail carefully wiped her hands on a clean rag, ensuring every trace of blacking was gone. She untied her smudged and dirty apron, folding it neatly before setting it aside. Her fingers worked quickly to unlace her shoes, 
slipping them off with practised ease. She knew better than to risk leaving any telltale footprints. With bare feet padding silently on the cold floor, Abigail made her way out of the kitchen. She paused at the bottom of the stairs, ears straining for any sound of movement above. Satisfied with the silence, she began her ascent, each step carefully placed to avoid the creaks and groans of old wood. Halfway up, a sudden burst of noise made her freeze. Running feet pounded overhead, accompanied by muffled giggles. Abigail's heart raced, but she held her position, barely daring to breathe. A door slammed somewhere on the upper floor, the sound echoing through the quiet house. Abigail rolled her eyes, recognising the telltale signs of a midnight rendezvous between the guests. Any other night, she might have made a mental note to investigate further, but tonight she had more pressing matters. She resumed her climb, moving with the stealth of a cat. At the junction of the hall outside the dining room, Abigail paused once more, listening intently. The house had fallen silent again, save for the occasional creak of settling wood. Confident that the coast was clear, Abigail continued through the darkened house. Her eyes, adjusted to the gloom, picked out the shapes of furniture and doorways. She moved with purpose, her steps sure despite the lack of light. She had a talent for memorising places at an instant, a skill which had proved invaluable to her. Abigail slipped into the study, her heart pounding in her chest. Moonlight filtered through the curtains, casting long shadows across the room. She moved with practised ease, her fingers ghosting over the surface of the desk. The drawer slid open without a sound, and Abigail rifled through its contents. Her breath caught as her hand closed around a bundle of letters, tied with a silk ribbon. Without hesitation, she tucked them into the deep pocket she'd sewn into her dress for just such a purpose. She retraced her steps, careful to leave everything as she'd found it. The study door closed behind her with a soft click, and she made her way back downstairs. In the kitchen, she left her dirty apron behind and slipped on her shoes. Abigail reached for her cloak, a large nondescript garment that hung by the servant's entrance. As she fastened it around her shoulders, she heard a scuff of feet behind her. Miss Abigail? A young voice piped up. Abigail froze, her fingers still on the clasp of her cloak. She turned slowly to see Tommy, one of the hall boys, rubbing sleep from his eyes. Where are you going? He asked, curiosity evident in his tone. Abigail's mind raced. She forced a smile onto her face, hoping the dim light would hide any sign of her nerves. Oh, Tommy, I've just noticed we're out of milk for the morning. I'm heading to the market to fetch some before it's too late. Tommy's brow furrowed. But there's always some delivered in the morning. Not early enough, and we need the freshest milk we can find to make the sweetbreads for breakfast. Abigail lied smoothly. Better ingredients, better meals, remember that. Now, off to bed with you. It's still some time before you're needed. We can't have you tired for your duties tomorrow. Abigail watched as Tommy shuffled back to the servants' hall his small form disappearing into the shadows. She knew he'd curl up on his thin mat, one of many hall boys crammed into the cramped space. A pang of guilt twisted in her chest, but she pushed it aside. She had a job to do. With a final glance around, Abigail slipped out through the servant's entrance. The cool air of early dawn hit her face, carrying with it the unmistakable scent of London, a mix of coal smoke, damp stone, and something indefinably urban. The city was just beginning to stir. In the distance, she heard the rumble of coal carts making their early morning deliveries. A stray cat yowled somewhere nearby, the sound echoing off the narrow streets. Abigail hurried down the alley beside the house, her footsteps quick and light on the cobblestones. She rounded a corner, ducking into a shadowy alcove. Here, hidden from prying eyes, she shrugged off her cloak. With practiced movements, she turned the garment inside out. The dull brown exterior gave way to a deep blue lining. Abigail fastened it around her shoulders once more, the change in colour transforming her appearance. 
If anyone had seen her leave the house, they'd be hard-pressed to recognise her now. She took a moment to catch her breath, her hand instinctively moving to the pocket where the stolen letters were hidden. The weight of them felt like a stone, dragging at her conscience, but she couldn't afford to dwell on it. Things like morality and a conscience were luxuries she couldn't afford just now. Abigail wove through the labyrinth of London streets, her steps quick and purposeful. The city was still shrouded in the grey light of dawn, the cobblestones slick with early morning dew. She kept to the shadows, her eyes darting from side to side, alert for any sign of pursuit or unwanted attention. As she turned onto a wider street, a well-appointed carriage came into view. It stood out starkly against the shabby buildings surrounding it, its polished wood and gleaming brass fittings speaking of wealth and privilege. A postillion stood at attention beside it, his livery immaculate despite the early hour. Abigail approached without hesitation, her stride never faltering. The postillion opened the carriage door with a slight bow, his face a mask of practised indifference. She climbed in, the plush interior a stark contrast to the rough street she'd just left behind. Once inside, Abigail pushed back her hood and reached up to her head. With a swift motion, she pulled off the wig she'd been wearing, revealing her own dark auburn hair beneath. She took a deep breath, allowing herself a moment to shed the persona she'd been wearing like a stranger's dress. Across from her, reclining on the velvet upholstered seat, sat Viscount Stratfordshire. His cold, grey eyes watched her with a calculating intensity that made her skin crawl. But Abigail met his gaze steadily her face betraying nothing of her inner turmoil. Well, the Viscount drawled, his voice carrying the cultured tones of the upper class. I trust you have something for me, Miss Brown. Abigail reached into her pocket and withdrew the bundle of letters, her fingers lingering on the silk ribbon for a moment before handing them over. She couldn't quite keep the frown from her face as the Viscount's eager hand snatched them away. Well, done, Miss Brown, he said, his voice dripping with smug satisfaction. You continue to prove your worth? He glanced up, catching sight of her expression. Tut tut, my dear. It's a bit late for squeamishness now, isn't it? Abigail said nothing, turning to look out the window, as the carriage lurched into motion. The streets of London slid by, the early morning light casting long shadows across the cobblestones. She watched a young chimney sweep trudge past, his face smudged with soot and felt a pang in her chest. I liked that last place, she said softly, still not looking at the Viscount. The mistress was kind. The Viscount scoffed, the sound harsh in the confined space of the carriage. Don't tell me you're growing sentimental, Miss Brown. If that's the case, you're of no use to me. Abigail tensed, her hands clenching in her lap. She knew all too well what becoming useless to the Viscount would mean. She turned to stare at him, the angles in his thin face highlighted by the dim light of the carriage. Not to worry, my dear, he said, his voice taking on a sharp, predatory edge. You'll really like what I've got planned next. Chapter 2 The morning sun streamed through the tall windows its harsh rays cutting through Matthew Beaumont's bleary vision. He groaned, lifting a heavy arm to shield his eyes from the offending light. His head throbbed in protest, the dull pounding an unpleasant reminder of the excesses from the night before. Rolling onto his back, Matthew winced as the cold tile floor bit into his shoulder blades. His fashionably tailored coat lay crumpled beside him, his shirt buttons undone and sleeves pushed up to his elbows. When had he discarded it? The details evaded him, lost in the haze of too much drink and too little restraint. With a grunt of effort, he pushed himself upright, the room spinning in a nauseating blur. His hand clutched the edge of the ornately carved table for support as he fought the wave of dizziness. Blinking rapidly, he waited for his surroundings to right themselves. It was, in a word a rather undignified manner for the Duke of Newcastle to wake. The Duke's sitting room materialised around him, 
a disarray of overturned chairs and scattered playing cards. An empty decanter lay on its side, a few errant droplets of brandy staining the plush Turkish rug. The acrid stench of stale smoke hung thick in the air, mingling with the musty odour of spilled spirits. Matthew grimaced, running a hand through his dishevelled hair. What began as an evening's entertainment with a few acquaintances had clearly spiralled out of control. Not an unfamiliar situation, if he were being honest with himself. Bracing against the table, he hauled himself to his feet, knees protesting the abuse. His mouth felt as dry as a desert, tongue thick and coated with the sour remnants of too much drink. He needed water, and plenty of it, if he hoped to rid himself of this debilitating ache. The bell pool dangled invitingly nearby. One tug would summon a footman with a pitcher and glass, a simple task to meet his needs. Yet something held him back, a fleeting sense of shame niggling at the edges of his muddled mind. Matthew pushed away the nagging thoughts, his pounding head protesting any attempt at deeper contemplation. Thinking hurt too much, he stumbled towards the bell pool, yanking it with more force than necessary. The sharp tug sent a fresh wave of pain through his skull. Seconds ticked by, then minutes. No footman appeared. No hurried footsteps echoed down the hall. The silence stretched on, broken only by Matthew's laboured breathing. Irritation flared in his chest, mingling with the lingering nausea. Where were those blasted servants? He'd wring their necks for this negligence. Well, not literally. Probably. His father might have, but Matthew wasn't his father. The thought sent a shudder through him, quickly suppressed. With a growl of frustration, Matthew lurched towards the door. If the servants wouldn't come to him, he'd go find them himself. He'd give them a piece of his mind. Hangover be damned. The room tilted alarmingly as he moved forcing him to grab the doorframe for support. Gritting his teeth, Matthew pushed on, determined to get to the bottom of this infuriating situation. He made it three unsteady steps into the hallway before his foot caught on something solid. Matthew pitched forward, arms flailing as he fought to regain his balance. A pained groan erupted from whatever he'd tripped over. Good God, Beaumont, a familiar voice rasped. Being kicked is a fine way of saying good morning. Matthew blinked, focusing on the crumpled form of Benedict Hampton sprawled across the hallway floor. The Earl of Sussex looked as dishevelled as Matthew felt, his usually immaculate blonde hair sticking up at odd angles. Hampton, Matthew croaked, his voice rough. What the devil are you doing down there? Wishing for death or a pot of coffee, Benedict groaned. Whichever comes faster, really. Agreed, Matthew mumbled, the thought of coffee sending a desperate pang through his parched throat. He drew himself up, chest expanding as he prepared to bellow for his butler. Jenkins! The shout echoed through the empty halls, reverberating painfully in both men's skulls. Matthew winced, immediately regretting his decision. Benedict clutched his head, letting out a pitiful moan. For the love of God, Beaumont, Benedict hissed. A little warning next time. Silence settled over them once more. No hurried footsteps, no apologetic response. Nothing but the pounding in Matthew's head and Benedict's laboured breathing. With visible effort, Benedict hauled himself to his feet, swaying slightly as he found his balance. Right then, he muttered. Shall we embark on a quest for refreshment and competent staff? Matthew nodded, instantly regretting the motion as the world tilted alarmingly. Together, they stumbled through the house, calling out for servants and finding nothing but empty rooms and eerie silence. Their meandering path led them to the dining room, where a crisp white letter, neatly folded, sat in the centre of the polished table. Matthew's stomach churned with unease. As he reached for it, breaking the seal with clumsy fingers, his eyes widened as he scanned the contents, disbelief warring with a creeping sense of dread. They're gone, he said, voice barely above a whisper. What 
What do you mean, gone? Benedict demanded, peering over Matthew's shoulder. Matthew swallowed hard, reading aloud. Your Grace, we regret to inform you that due to continued non-payment of wages, the household staff has collectively decided to withdraw their services. We wish you the best in your future endeavours. The letter slipped from Matthew's fingers, fluttering to the floor, as the full weight of their situation settled over him. No servants. No coffee. And, if his foggy memory served him correctly, no money to rectify the situation. He slumped into a nearby chair, the ornate wood creaking under his substantial frame. How had it come to this? The Duke of Newcastle, reduced to an empty house and unpaid debts. His father would be rolling in his grave, or perhaps laughing at his son's incompetence. Come now, Beaumont. Benedict's voice cut through Matthew's spiralling thoughts. It's not the end of the world. Matthew looked up, narrowing his eyes at his friend's forced cheerfulness. How could Hampton sound so bloody chipper? The man should be nursing a hangover to rival his own. Benedict clapped a hand on Matthew's shoulder, nearly toppling him from the chair. I say we make our way to the club. Nothing a hearty breakfast can't cure, eh? Matthew grunted, unconvinced. The thought of food made his stomach royal, but the promise of strong coffee held a certain appeal. Still, the idea of facing society in his current state. I don't know, Hampton, he muttered, running a hand through his dishevelled hair. I'm not fit for public consumption. Benedict chuckled, the sound grating on Matthew's frayed nerves. Nonsense! A splash of water, a change of clothes, you'll be right as rain. Matthew sighed, knowing resistance was futile. When Benedict set his mind to something, there was no dissuading him. With a Herculean effort, he hauled himself to his feet. Fine, he grumbled, steadying himself against the table. But if I vomit on some dowager's shoes, I'm blaming you. Benedict's grin widened, a spark of mischief in his eyes. I wouldn't have it any other way, old boy. As they made their way towards the front door, Matthew's steps heavy and reluctant. He couldn't shake the gnawing worry in his gut. The club might offer temporary respite, but it wouldn't solve the larger problem looming over him. How long could he keep up this charade before everything came crashing down? Matthew squinted against the harsh morning light as they stepped onto the bustling London street. The din of vendors hawking their wares and the clatter of passing carriages assaulted his senses, intensifying his already pounding headache. Benedict strode ahead, seemingly unaffected by their night of excess. Matthew trudged after him, his stomach lurching with each step. Look there, Beaumont, Benedict called, gesturing towards a nearby food stall. We could grab a quick bite to settle our stomachs. Matthew's lip curled as he eyed the poor man's food on offer. Toast sandwiches, consisting of a piece of buttered and toasted bread sandwiched between two other slices of bread. I'd sooner eat my own shoe, he muttered, averting his gaze. Let's press on to White's. I need something civilised. He quickened his pace, automatically heading towards the familiar haven of White's club. The promise of a proper meal and strong coffee spurred him forward. Uh, about that, Benedict's voice held a note of hesitation. We can't exactly go to White's. Matthew halted, turning to face his companion. What do you mean we can't go to White's? Benedict cleared his throat, looking uncharacteristically sheepish. Don't you remember? We were rather forcefully ejected last week. Something about Lord Rutherford's wig and a bottle of port. The memory crashed over the Matthew like a bucket of ice water. He groaned, pinching the bridge of his nose. Bloody hell! How long are we barred for? Indefinitely, I'm afraid, Benedict replied, wincing. Matthew's mood, already foul, plummeted further. He glared at the passing crowds, resenting their apparent cheer and lack of crushing hangovers. Fine, he growled, changing course. Boodles it is, then. And, Hampton, if you've managed to get us banned from there as well, I swear, I'll toss you in the Thames myself. 
Benedict raised his hands in mock surrender. On my honour, Boodle's remains unsullied by our antics, at least as far as I can recall. With a grunt of acknowledgement, Matthew set off towards their new destination, Benedict falling into step beside him. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. The promise of refuge, however temporary from both his hangover and his mounting troubles, drove him forward. The brisk air and exercise also did quite a bit to clear his foggy head. Matthew's relief was palpable as they stepped into the familiar confines of Boodles. The club's hushed atmosphere and dark wood panelling offered a welcome respite from the harsh outside world. He made a beeline for a secluded corner table, collapsing into a plush leather chair with a grateful sigh. A waiter materialised at their side, and Matthew wasted no time ordering. Coffee, the largest pot you have, and whatever's hot in the kitchen. Benedict raised an eyebrow but said nothing, simply nodding his agreement to the waiter. As they waited for their order, Matthew massaged his temples, trying to will away the persistent throb behind his eyes. The events of the morning weighed heavily on him, a knot of anxiety forming in his gut. The arrival of a steaming pot of coffee was a godsend. Matthew poured himself a cup with trembling hands, inhaling the rich aroma before taking a long, scalding sip. The bitter liquid burned a path down his throat, but he welcomed the discomfort. It was something tangible to focus on, rather than the looming disaster of his empty house and unpaid staff. Benedict watched him over the rim of his own cup, an uncharacteristically serious expression on his face. So, Beaumont, he said, his tone careful. What are you going to do now? Matthew froze, the cup halfway to his lips. The question hung in the air between them, heavy with implications. He lowered the cup slowly, buying time as he struggled to formulate a response. The truth was, he wasn't broke. Not really. There were accounts, substantial ones, held by his father's estate. Accounts that were technically his now. But the thought of touching that money, of acknowledging his inheritance and all it represented, made his skin crawl. Before he could answer, their food arrived. Matthew seized upon the distraction, focusing intently on the plate before him. Without really tasting it, he began shoveling food into his mouth, hoping to fill the pit of worry gnawing at his insides. Benedict's question lingered, unanswered, as Matthew continued to eat with single-minded determination. Each bite was mechanical, driven more by a desperate need for distraction than any real hunger. The flavours blurred together, indistinct and unimportant. All of that mattered was the repetitive motion, a fork to plate to mouth, anything to avoid confronting the reality of his situation. Matthew's focus on his meal was interrupted by a boisterous group of young men entering the club. He recognised them as fellow members of the ton, though their names escaped his addled mind. His stomach clenched as they spotted him and Benedict, their faces lighting up with mischievous grins. Well, well. If it isn't the indomitable Duke of Newcastle, one of them called out, striding over to their table. Still standing after last night's festivities, I see. Matthew forced a weak smile, wishing he could sink into his chair and disappear. The young buck's voice grated on his nerves, far too loud for his sensitive state. Another of the group chimed in, eyeing Matthew's dishevelled appearance with barely concealed amusement. Good God! God, your grace, you look like you've been dragged through a hedge backwards. How on earth are you even upright? The others laughed, clearly entertained by Matthew's sorry state. He felt his cheeks burn with embarrassment, acutely aware of his rumpled clothes and unkempt hair. Gentlemen, Matthew managed to croak out, his voice rougher than he'd like. You're too kind. Benedict, sensing Matthew's discomfort, attempted to deflect the attention. Now, now, lads, let's not exaggerate. 
The Duke is merely embracing a more relaxed style this morning. This elicited another round of laughter from the group. Matthew gritted his teeth, fighting the urge to snap at them. He knew they meant no real harm, but in his current state, their jovial ribbing felt like salt in an open wound. Come now, your grace, one of the young men said, clapping Matthew on the shoulder hard enough to make him wince. You must regale us with tales of your latest adventures. We heard whispers of quite the raucous affair at your townhouse last night. Matthew's stomach lurched at the thought of recounting the previous evening's events. The realisation that his financial troubles were now fodder for gossip among these young bucks only added to his growing sense of despair. Matthew felt a wave of relief wash over him as Benedict stepped in, his smooth voice cutting through the clamour of the young buck's laughter. "'Come now, gentlemen,' Benedict drawled, a hint of disdain colouring his tone, "'asking someone to recount a party you yourselves attended. "'That's the height of tedium. "'Surely there are more important matters to discuss.' Matthew shot his friend a grateful look, silently thanking him for the timely intervention. He took a long sip of coffee, using the moment to compose himself. One of the young men, however, seemed to take Benedict's words as an invitation. You're absolutely right, Hampton. More important matters indeed, like when we can expect the next soiree at Newcastle House. Matthew felt his stomach drop, panic rising in his chest. He struggled to maintain his composure, forcing his features into a mask of nonchalance. The thought of hosting another party, with no staff and dwindling funds, was enough to make his head spin. Clearing his throat, Matthew adopted an air of casual indifference. Ah, well, I'm afraid that's not likely to happen any time soon, gentlemen, he said, his voice steadier than he felt. It seems the servants at my house have proven to have too delicate a constitution to remain in my service. He let out a forced chuckle, hoping to sell the lie. Can you believe it? They simply couldn't handle the work. Good help is so hard to find these days. Matthew held his breath, praying that his explanation would be accepted without further questioning. The last thing he needed was for these gossip mongers to catch wind of his true predicament. Oh, what a shame, your grace! One of them exclaimed, his tone dripping with false sympathy. To think your staff would abandon you like that. Another chimed in, barely concealing his glee at the juicy tidbit. How dreadfully inconvenient for you. I can't imagine how you'll manage without them. Matthew forced a rueful smile, his stomach churning. He opened his mouth to offer some vague platitude when a smooth, cultured voice cut through the chatter. I couldn't help but overhear your predicament, Your Grace. Matthew turned to see a distinguished gentleman at a nearby table, folding his newspaper with practised ease. The man's sharp grey eyes met Matthew's, a sympathetic smile playing on his lips. With a jolt, Matthew recognised him as Viscount Stratfordshire. The Viscount leaned in, his voice lowered conspiratorially. It's beneath a duke's dignity to be completely without staff, wouldn't you agree? Matthew's throat tightened, unsure how to respond. The Viscount's smile widened, revealing perfectly straight teeth. I'd be more than happy to lend you my own cook for a while, he offered, his tone generous. Just until you can get your household affairs in order, of course. Matthew blinked, taken aback by the unexpected offer. But with the young bucks hanging on every word, and his own desperate situation looming, Matthew found himself nodding. That's very kind of you, Viscount, he managed, his voice rougher than he'd like. I, I appreciate the offer. The Viscount's eyes glinted with something Matthew couldn't quite place. Think nothing of it, Your Grace. After all, we must look out for one another, mustn't we? Us, gentlemen, he said, gesturing with his newspaper to the other Boodle's patrons, we must stick together. Grudgingly, Matthew nodded, figuring that at least solved the problem of luncheon. Chapter 3 Matthew trudged back to his townhouse, his mood falling with each step. The morning's events at Boodle's had left him feeling drained and uneasy. As he pushed open the front door, 
The stale stench of last night's revelry assaulted his senses. He stood in the foyer, surveying the damage. Glasses littered every surface, some tipped over, their contents leaving sticky trails across polished wood. Candle stubs dotted the tables, surrounded by pools of hardened wax. A pair of ladies' gloves hung forgotten from a lampshade. Matthew sighed, running a hand through his dishevelled hair. He'd never given much thought to the state of his home before, but now, faced with the prospect of cleaning it himself, he felt overwhelmed. Gingerly, he made his way to the drawing room, careful not to step on any broken glass. The room was in even worse shape than the foyer. Cushions from the settee were strewn about, and a half-empty bottle of port teetered precariously on the edge of a side table. Matthew grabbed the bottle, taking a long swig before setting it down with more force than necessary. He cast his gaze around the room, trying to decide where to start. With a groan, he bent to pick up a few glasses, stacking them haphazardly on a silver tray. His movements were clumsy, unused to such menial tasks. As he reached for another glass, his elbow knocked into the tray, sending the lot crashing to the floor. Damn it all! Matthew bellowed, kicking at the shards of glass. He slumped onto the settee, burying his face in his hands. The enormity of his situation crashed over him like a wave. How had it come to this? A duke, reduced to cleaning up his own messes? He glanced up, catching sight of himself in a mirror across the room. His cravat hung loose around his neck, his waistcoat was stained, and his eyes were bloodshot. He barely recognised the man staring back at him. Matthew's head snapped up at the sound of knocking. He blinked, momentarily confused. The noise echoed through the empty house again, more insistent this time. He frowned, waiting for the familiar sound of footsteps hurrying to answer the door. Silence stretched on, broken only by another round of knocking, louder than before. With a start, Matthew realised the truth of his situation. There was no one else to answer the door. No butler, no footman, not even a scullery maid. Just him. The thought was so absurd he almost laughed. Him, the Duke of Newcastle, answering his own door like some common shopkeeper. It was preposterous. He remained seated, hoping whoever it was would give up and leave. But the knocking persisted, growing more impatient with each passing moment. Matthew stood, swaying slightly as his head swam from the lingering effects of last night's excesses. He took a tentative step toward the foyer, then hesitated. Did he even know how to open the front door? He'd never had cause to do it himself before. Grumbling under his breath, he made his way to the entrance. His hand hovered over the doorknob, foreign and unfamiliar. With a deep breath, he grasped it and pulled. Matthew blinked, his bleary eyes struggling to focus on the figure before him. A young woman stood on his doorstep, her plain dress and white cap marking her as a servant. For a moment, he thought he must still be dreaming. Your grace, she curtsied, her voice soft but clear. The Viscount Stratfordshire sent me. I am to be your new cook. Matthew stared at the young woman on his doorstep, his alcohol-addled brain struggling to process her words. A cook? Her? She was prettier than he'd expected for a cook, with dark auburn hair peeking out from under her starched white cap. Her blue eyes met his, and he felt a flicker of... something. Annoyance? Curiosity? He couldn't quite place it. Suddenly aware of his dishevelled state, Matthew straightened his posture and cleared his throat. He was acutely conscious of his rumpled clothes and the stale smell of spirits that clung to him. The vulnerability of his situation grated on his nerves, making him grumpy and defensive. Why the devil didn't you use the servant's entrance? He demanded, his voice harsher than he'd intended. This is hardly proper protocol. The cook's eyebrows raised slightly, but her expression remained neutral. My apologies, your grace but it's rather hard to do so when there aren't any servants to answer, said servant's entrance door. Matthew frowned, unsure how to proceed. He couldn't very well send her away. God knows he needed the help. 
but her presence unsettled him. She was too pretty, too composed, too... something. It made him feel off balance, and he didn't like it one bit. He stepped aside, allowing the young woman to enter. As she crossed the threshold, her eyes darted around, taking in the chaos that surrounded them. He felt a surge of defensiveness, his shoulders tensing as he watched her survey the wreckage of his home. To his surprise, she made no comment about the state of things. Instead, she turned to him with an expectant look. When would you like me to begin, Your Grace? She asked, her tone maddeningly polite. Matthew gaped at her, incredulous. Was she blind? The answer was staring her in the face, screaming from every corner of the dishevelled foyer. His temper, already frayed from the morning's events, snapped. When... Would I like you to begin? He repeated, his voice dripping with sarcasm. Perhaps you'd care to take a leisurely stroll through the house first, or shall we sit down to tea and discuss the weather? He gestured wildly at the mess around them, his face flushing with a mixture of anger and embarrassment. For God's sake, woman, look around you. This place is a disaster. When do I want you to begin? Immediately. This very instant, yesterday, if it were possible. Matthew ran a hand through his hair, his frustration mounting. I've got broken glass in the drawing room, God knows what in the dining room, and I can't even remember the last time I saw the kitchen. So, yes, by all means, take your time deciding when to start. It's not as if there's any rush. He glared at her, daring her to challenge him. Part of him hoped she would if only to give him an excuse to vent more of his pent-up anger and humiliation. Instead, she stood there, cool as a cucumber, regarding him with those impossibly blue eyes. Your grace, she said, her voice maddeningly even. I understand your frustration. However, I was sent here to be your cook, not your maid of all work. Matthew felt his face grow hot, a mixture of embarrassment and indignation coursing through him. Who did this slip of a girl think she was, speaking to him like that? She continued, seemingly oblivious to his mounting irritation. Given the state of the house, which I must say is far worse than I was led to believe, you're asking quite a bit of me. Her words hit him like a slap in the face. Matthew clenched his fists, struggling to maintain what little composure he had left. He was acutely aware of how he must look dishevelled, hung over, and now being lectured by a servant in his own home. I, you, he sputtered, unable to form a coherent response. The absurdity of the situation wasn't lost on him. Here he was, the Duke of Newcastle, being put in his place by a cook. A pretty cook, but a, a cook nonetheless. Matthew felt his temper flare, his face growing hot with indignation, who did this woman think she was? He drew himself up to his full height, towering over her. If it's too much for you to handle, then you're free to find another household to work in, he snapped, his voice dripping with disdain. I'm sure there are plenty of other cooks who'd be grateful for the opportunity to work for a duke. He expected her to cower, to apologise, to beg for forgiveness. Instead, her expression remained infuriatingly calm, those blue eyes meeting his without a hint of fear or remorse. Fine, she said simply, her voice as cool and composed as ever. Matthew blinked, momentarily thrown off balance by her response. He watched, dumbfounded, as she curtsied, just enough to be polite, but not an inch more, and turned to leave. As she reached for the door handle, Matthew felt a surge of panic. Wait, was she actually leaving? He opened his mouth to call her back, but pride kept the words lodged in his throat. He couldn't bring himself to admit he needed her, that he was utterly lost without servants to manage his household. Matthew lurched forward, his hand outstretched to stop the cook from leaving. The sudden movement sent a wave of nausea through him, and he grasped his head as pain lanced through his skull. His stomach roiled, threatening to expel what little he'd eaten that morning. 
He groaned, eyes screwed shut against the onslaught of discomfort. When he opened them again, he found the cook watching him with a mixture of exasperation and pity. She sighed, closing the door she'd half opened. Come on, your grace, she said, her tone softer than before. She took his arm to you, her touch surprisingly gentle. Let's get you seated before you fall over. Matthew allowed himself to be led to the drawing room, too miserable to protest. The cook guided him to a chair, her hand steady on his arm. Sit here and wait, she instructed, her voice firm but not unkind. Matthew slumped in the chair, his head spinning. He watched the cook's retreating form as she disappeared down the stairs, her footsteps fading into silence. A mixture of emotions churned within him, indignation at being ordered about by a servant, relief that someone had finally taken charge, and a gnawing sense of shame at the state of his life. He closed his eyes, listening to the distant sounds of movement from below. The clatter of pots and pans, the rush of water, unfamiliar noises in his once silent house. Matthew couldn't remember the last time he'd heard such domestic sounds. Opening his eyes, he surveyed the chaos around him. Broken glass glittered on the floor, empty bottles stood as silent witnesses to his excesses, and the acrid smell of stale smoke hung in the air. Was this truly what his life had become? A duke, sitting helpless in his own drawing room, waiting for a cook to come to his rescue? The absurdity of the situation wasn't lost on him. He, Matthew Beaumont, Duke of Newcastle, reduced to this pitiful state. His father would be turning in his grave if he could see him now. The thought brought a bitter sort of amusement. The notion of spiting his father, years dead, always made him feel a little better and a little worse. Minutes ticked by, each one stretching into an eternity. Matthew found himself straining to hear the cook's movements, desperate for any sign that she hadn't simply walked out the back door. The silence between clatters and clangs made him anxious, his imagination conjuring images of her leaving him to his squalor. He shifted uncomfortably in his seat, torn between the desire to check on her and the fear of appearing too eager or dependent. What if she saw him hovering? Would she mock him? Pity him? He wasn't sure which would be worse. As he sat there, wallowing in his misery and uncertainty, Matthew couldn't help but wonder how he'd ended up here. When had his life spiralled so far out of control? And more importantly, how was he going to fix it? Chapter 4 Abigail stepped into the Duke's kitchen, her eyes widening at the sight. Despite the chaos upstairs, this space was a cook's dream. Spacious and airy, with gleaming copper pots hanging from hooks and a massive stove that could easily handle a feast. Sunlight streamed through tall windows, illuminating the well-worn butcher block counters. She ran her hand along the smooth surface, marvelling at the quality. What a waste, she muttered, taking in the barren pantry and empty cold larder. As she tied on her apron, Abigail couldn't shake the nagging feeling in her gut. The Viscount's smug face flashed through her mind. What game was he playing this time? The Duke seemed more interested in drinking himself into oblivion than anything else. Might as well make the best of it, she sighed, rolling up her sleeves. Abigail scoured the pantry, cobbling together ingredients for a restorative broth. The knife flew across the cutting board as she diced vegetables, the rhythmic chopping soothing her frayed nerves. What have you gotten yourself into this time, Abigail Brown? she murmured, tossing the vegetables into a pot of simmering water. The kitchen came alive as she worked, filling with the comforting aroma of herbs and spices. Abigail kneaded dough for toasted sippets, her mind churning over the bizarre situation. The Duke's drunken snores drifted down from above, punctuated by occasional groans. Abigail shook her head, exasperated. How could the Viscount possibly benefit from this wreck of a man. But she pushed aside her curiosity about the Viscount's plans. It wasn't her place to question his motives. 
She had a job to do, and that was that. She wiped her hands on her apron and headed for the kitchen door, eager to see what the garden might offer. The afternoon air was warm as she stepped outside. Abigail inhaled deeply, relishing the earthy scent of damp soil and greenery. The kitchen garden stretched before her, a bit overgrown but still promising. Her eyes lit up as she spotted patches of herbs peeking through the tangle of weeds. Well, well, she murmured, crouching down to inspect a cluster of aromatic leaves. At least someone had the sense to plant a proper garden. Her fingers brushed against the rough leaves of sage and the delicate fronds of dill. But it was the sight of plump garlic bulbs and knobbly ginger roots that truly lifted her spirits. Abigail grinned, imagining the punch of flavour they'd add to her broth, to say nothing of easing the Duke's troubled stomach. She harvested what she needed, cradling the bounty in her apron as she hurried back to the kitchen. The ginger and garlic were quickly peeled and added to the simmering pot, filling the air with their pungent aroma. Abigail ladled the steaming broth into a bowl, arranging the crisp sippets on a small plate beside it. She took a deep breath, steadying herself for the encounter ahead, and made her way upstairs. The Duke's snores had subsided, replaced by pitiful groans. Abigail balanced the tray carefully as she nudged open the drawing room door with her hip. Your Grace, she called softly, wrinkling her nose at the stale air. I've brought you something to eat. The Duke's eyes fluttered open. For a fleeting moment, his face softened, Vulnerability etched across his features. It was as if no one had ever shown him such simple kindness before. The sight tugged at something deep within her, a part of herself she'd long since buried. But the moment passed as quickly as it came. The Duke's mask slipped back into place, his lip curling as he eyed the tray she held. What's this supposed to be? He sneered, pushing himself up on his elbows. Gruel for invalids. Abigail bit back a sharp retort. It's a restorative broth, your grace, to settle your stomach and ease your head. The duke sniffed the air, his nose wrinkling. Smells like something from a back alley chop house. She set the tray down on a nearby table, fighting to keep her voice even. I assure you, it's made from the finest ingredients your kitchen had to offer. Which isn't. Saying much, he grumbled, eyeing the steaming bowl with suspicion. Abigail's patience wore thin. She'd spent hours preparing this meal, determined to do her job well despite the circumstances. The Duke's ingratitude stung more than she cared to admit. Perhaps if your grace hadn't driven away every servant in the household, there might be more to work with, she said, unable to keep the edge from her voice. The Duke's eyes flashed with anger, but beneath it, Abigail caught a glimmer of something else. Shame? Regret? Whatever it was, it vanished in an instant. She watched the Duke more closely as he lifted the spoon to his lips, his expression a mix of suspicion and reluctance. She held her breath, waiting for his reaction. The moment the broth touched his tongue, his eyes widened. The Duke's face transformed, surprise and pleasure washing away the earlier disdain. He couldn't hide it. The involuntary twitch of his lips, the slight relaxation of his furrowed brow. Abigail felt a surge of smug satisfaction course through her. It was a look she knew well, one she'd seen countless times before. No matter how stubborn or ill-tempered her diners might be, her food always won them over in the end. The Duke took another spoonful, then another, his earlier complaints forgotten. Abigail fought to keep a neutral expression, but inside, she was glowing with pride. This was why she cooked, why she endured the long hours and demanding patrons. There was nothing quite like watching someone truly enjoy her food. As she watched the Duke devour the broth, a small spark of satisfaction warmed her chest. His earlier petulance had melted away, replaced by an almost childlike contentment as he sopped up the last drops with a piece of toasted sippet. 
She took the opportunity to survey the room more closely. The opulent furnishings were buried beneath a layer of neglect. Dust coated every surface, and discarded clothing lay strewn about like fallen leaves. Empty bottles littered the floor, a testament to the Duke's successes. Abigail's lips pressed into a thin line. It was clear that what the Duke needed was a firm hand, someone to pull him out of this downward spiral. But to do that, she'd need more information. Why had all the servants left? What had driven this man to such depths? She cleared her throat. Your Grace, I'm glad you enjoyed the meal. However, I must speak plainly. Skilled as I may be, I cannot manage this household alone. I'll need assistance. The Duke looked up from his empty bowl, his earlier vulnerability replaced by a weary indifference. He shrugged, a sardonic smile tugging at his lips. Good luck with that, Miss Brown. No one will work for me. Abigail's brow furrowed. Surely that can't be true. A household of this size. You don't understand. He cut her off, his voice bitter. They've all left, every last one of them, and word spreads quickly in service circles. No one will come near this place now. Abigail stood her ground, refusing to be cowed by his defeatist attitude. Leave that to me. I will take charge of interviewing the candidates. You may rest assured that I will only accept those willing to work hard and show the appropriate amount of loyalty. Abigail met the Duke's gaze unflinching. His blue eyes, bloodshot and weary, searched her face for a long moment before he finally let out a resigned sigh. Very well, Miss Brown, do as you see fit he said, his lips twisting into a wry smile. I suppose I've been reduced to having a cook run my household. Can't expect much at this point, can I? Abigail bit back a sharp retort. She gathered the empty tray, her fingers curling tightly around its edges. As she turned to leave, she caught a glimpse of the Duke slumping back onto the chaise, one arm flung dramatically over his eyes. She shook her head, exasperated and made her way out of the drawing room. The grand staircase creaked beneath her feet as she descended, her mind whirling with plans. Where to start? The kitchen would need a thorough cleaning, and then there was the matter of restocking the pantry. Miss Brown? The Duke's voice, softer now, drifted down from above. Abigail paused, looking back over her shoulder. Thank you he said, the words tinged with a sincerity that caught her off guard. Abigail nodded, unsure how to respond. She hurried down the remaining steps, eager to escape the sudden tension in the air. Back in the kitchen, she set the tray down with more force than necessary. The Duke's thanks echoed in her mind, at odds with his earlier petulance. She couldn't make sense of him. One moment he was all arrogance and disdain. The next, what? Vulnerability, gratitude. Abigail's hands moved automatically, washing dishes as her thoughts churned. What was she really doing here? The Viscount's smug face flashed through her mind again. He must have some ulterior motive for placing her in this household, but what could it be? She dried her hands on her apron, frustration building in her chest. The Duke seemed more interested in drinking himself into oblivion than anything of consequence. What secrets could he possibly have that would interest the Viscount? Abigail sighed, pushing aside her questions. She had a job to do regardless of the Viscount's schemes. And right now, that job involved bringing some semblance of order to this chaotic household. Chapter 5 Abigail wiped her brow with the back of her hand, surveying the kitchen. After days of scrubbing and organising, it finally resembled a proper workspace. The copper pots gleamed, and the pantry was stocked with fresh ingredients. She'd even managed to coax some life back into the ancient stove. A sharp rap at the servant's entrance pulled her from her thoughts. Her heart quickened as she hurried to answer it, hoping it was who she expected. 
She swung open the door, relief washing over her at the sight of the towering figure on the threshold. Virgil, thank goodness you're here. Virgil ducked his head to enter, his bulk filling the narrow doorway. His eyes swept the kitchen, taking in every detail before settling back on Abigail. Miss Brown, you said you needed help? Abigail nodded, gesturing for him to follow her to the table. I do. This household, it's unlike anything I've encountered before. The Duke, he's... She paused, searching for the right words. Troubled. And I fear there may be more going on here than meets the eye. Virgil's expression remained impassive, but Abigail caught the slight narrowing of his eyes. He tilted his gleaming, impeccably shaved head. He understood her meaning without her having to spell it out. I see, he rumbled. And what would you have me do? Abigail leaned in, lowering her voice. For now, just keep your eyes and ears open. The Duke needs a butler, but you'll likely need to be his valet as well. You'll fit the bill perfectly. But I can't shake the feeling that we might need your... other skills before long. Virgil nodded, a ghost of a smile touching his lips. As you wish, Miss Brown, I'll start right away. As Virgil turned to leave, Abigail caught his arm. And, Virgil, thank you. I'm glad you're here. She paused for a moment and gave Virgil a small smile. I'm not sure we'll have any livery to fit you, though. He gave her a solemn nod before disappearing up the stairs. Abigail watched him go, a mixture of relief and apprehension settling in her chest. Whatever storm was brewing, she felt better knowing Virgil had her back. Abigail gathered her wicker basket, the handle worn smooth from years of use. She stepped out of the Duke's townhouse, inhaling deeply as the crisp spring air filled her lungs. The streets of Regency London bustled with life, a stark contrast to the gloomy interior she'd left behind. Her eyes scanned the crowd, searching for the telltale purple blooms of violets. The sweet syrup would be perfect for flavouring desserts, and perhaps even coaxing a smile from the Duke's dour face. She made her way down the cobblestone street, her skirt swishing around her ankles. The cacophony of city life enveloped her, the clop of horses' hooves, the chatter of passers-by, and the distant calls of street vendors. A group of finely dressed ladies passed by, their parasols twirling above their heads. Abigail ducked her head, slipping their notice entirely. In her simple dress and apron, she was a world apart from their silk and lace. It was the main asset to her position. She was invisible to most of the world. Abigail turned down a narrow side street, away from the main thoroughfare. Here, the noise of the city faded, replaced by the chirping of birds and the rustle of new leaves. Abigail stepped slowed as she approached the edge of one of London's infamous rookeries. The air grew thick with the stench of sewage and rotting garbage. Narrow, crooked streets twisted between ramshackle buildings that leaned precariously over the cobblestones. Ragged figures huddled in doorways, their hollow eyes following her every move. She clutched her basket tighter, her knuckles whitening. Despite her own humble beginnings, the stark poverty of this place made her heart ache. Children with sunken cheeks darted between the legs of passers-by, their small hands quick to snatch at unguarded pockets. As the Abigail rounded a corner, her gaze fell upon a girl no older than thirteen. The child's face was smudged with grime, her clothes little more than tattered rags. But in her arms, she cradled a basket filled with small bundles of violets, their purple blooms a startling splash of colour against the dreary backdrop. Abigail approached cautiously, not wanting to startle the girl. Hello there, she said softly, crouching down to the child's level. Those are lovely violets you have. The girl's eyes, large and wary, met Abigail's. She didn't speak, but her grip on the basket tightened. I'd like to buy some, if you're selling, Abigail continued, keeping her voice gentle. 
she reached into her pocket, fishing out a few coins. How much for three bundles? The girl's gaze flickered between Abigail's face and the coins in her hand. With eyes that were already painfully world-weary, the girl glanced over Abigail. Abigail was dressed like a servant, but her dress was well made. And unlike the girl, she wore shoes. Four pence, the girl said, her voice raspy from shouting at passers-by. Four pence for three bundles, Abigail said, pursing her lips. That seems a bit much. Four's fair, the girl shot back. Despite herself, Abigail found herself resisting a grin. It was her turn to look the girl over. Her dress was too short, showing part of her calves. Her dirty face was painfully thin, making her green eyes appear even larger. Her hair may have been red, but it was hard to tell with all the soot and grime. Two is more fair, Abigail countered. She held out the coins, careful not to make any sudden movements. With lightning speed, the girl snatched the money and thrust three small bouquets of violets into Abigail's hands. Abigail stood, cradling the violets in her palm. Their sweet scent cut through the foul air, a reminder of beauty amidst squalor. She tucked them carefully into her basket and eyed the girl again, her heart twisting with a mix of pity and admiration. There was a spark in those green eyes, a resilience that reminded her of herself at that age. What's your name? Abigail asked, her voice soft. The girl hesitated, her eyes darting around as if searching for an escape route. Finally, she mumbled, Rosemary. A smile tugged at Abigail's lips. Rosemary? That's my favourite herb, you know. It smells wonderful and adds such flavour to roasts. Rosemary's eyes widened slightly, a flicker of interest crossing her face before she masked it with indifference. Abigail crouched down again, bringing herself to eye level with the girl. You seem a clever girl, Rosemary. Do you have any family? Rosemary's nose wrinkled, her expression darkening. An uncle, she muttered, then added with a shrug. Sort of. Abigail's brow furrowed at the girl's tone. There was a story there, one she suspected was far from pleasant. Abigail took a deep breath, weighing her options. The girl before her was clearly in need, and something about Rosemary's resilience struck a chord deep within her. Rosemary, Abigail said, her voice gentle but firm, how would you like a job, a better one than selling flowers on the street? Abigail's heart sank as Rosemary's eyes narrowed with suspicion. The girl took a step back, her thin frame tensing like a cornered animal. My uncle warned me about ladies like you, Rosemary spat, her voice low and wary, coming down here, all nice-like, offering jobs. But we know what you really want. Girls for your special houses. Abigail felt her cheeks flush with a mix of anger and shame. The implication stung, but she understood the girl's wariness. How many times had she herself narrowly escaped such a fate? No, Rosemary, that's not... Abigail started, then paused, taking a deep breath. She needed to choose her words carefully. I'm not that kind of lady. I'm a cook, in service to a duke. I'm offering you honest work in the kitchens, nothing more. Don't mistake me. It won't pay much, but you'll be well fed and have a warm place to sleep. Abigail leaned in closer to Rosemary, lowering her voice to a near whisper. The girl's wariness hadn't entirely faded, but curiosity now sparked in those large green eyes. Listen, Rosemary, Abigail said, her tone conspiratorial. I need more than just a kitchen maid. I need someone who knows these streets, someone who isn't easily frightened. Rosemary's brow furrowed, her gaze sharpening as she studied Abigail's face. The suspicion in her eyes gave way to a flicker of intrigue. Abigail continued, her heart racing. I have to go down to the docks next, and I don't want to go alone. You afraid? Rosemary asked, her eyes tilting a little at the corners with bemusement. A little, 
Abigail admitted. I'd like some companionship. Abigail's heart leapt as Rosemary set down her basket of violets. The girl's eyes darted around, as if checking for anyone who might object to her leaving. Then, with a quick nod, she stepped to Abigail's side. All right, Rosemary muttered, her voice barely audible. I'll go with you. But no funny business, yeah? Abigail nodded, relief washing over her. No funny business, she agreed. Just a quick trip to the docks and back. They set off together, Rosemary's small form shadowing Abigail's steps. The girl moved with a quiet grace, weaving through the crowded streets with ease. Abigail found herself struggling to keep up at times, marvelling at how Rosemary seemed to anticipate the flow of the crowd. As they neared the waterfront, the air grew thick with the scent of salt and fish. The cobblestone streets gave way to wooden planks, creaking under their feet. Abigail's eyes widened as they rounded the corner, the bustling docks coming into view. The scene before them was chaos incarnate. Sailors of all shapes and sizes swarmed the area, their voices a racket of shouts and curses in a dozen different languages. Massive ships loomed over them, their rigging creating a web against the grey sky. Dockhands rushed back and forth, hauling crates and barrels with practised efficiency. Abigail felt a twinge of um, unease as she took in the rough-looking men around them. Many sported scars and tattoos, their weathered faces speaking of hard lives at sea. She instinctively stepped closer to Rosemary, her hand brushing the girl's shoulder. To her surprise, Rosemary seemed unfazed by the chaos. The girl's green eyes darted about, taking in every detail with a shrewd gaze that belied her years. She tugged at Abigail's sleeve, pointing towards a less crowded area of the docks. This way, Rosemary said, her voice barely audible above the din, less likely to get knocked over there. Abigail nodded, grateful for the girl's guidance. As they picked their way through the crowd, she couldn't help but wonder what other surprises this young street urchin might have in store. Abigail's eyes narrowed as she spotted a weathered sign swinging above a narrow doorway. The salty dog was barely legible, the paint peeling and faded. She took a deep breath, stealing herself for what lay ahead. Stay close, she murmured to Rosemary, who nodded silently and pressed against her side. Abigail pushed open the heavy wooden door, wincing as it creaked loudly. The tavern's dim interior assaulted her senses immediately. The stench of stale beer, sweat, and something far less pleasant made her stomach churn. Smoke hung thick in the air, stinging her eyes. As they stepped inside, every head turned, conversations died mid-sentence, and dozens of weathered faces stared at them with a mixture of curiosity and suspicion. Abigail felt Rosemary's small hand clutch at her skirt. Ignoring the prickling sensation of eyes on her back, Abigail scanned the room. Her gaze swept past grimy tables and surly-looking patrons, searching for one face in particular. She'd almost given up hope when she spotted him at a table in the far corner. Henry William's thinning hair was slicked back in a poor attempt at elegance, his once fine coat now threadbare at the elbows. He leaned over the table, his large brown eyes alight with excitement as he ran some sort of game of chance. A small crowd had gathered around him, coins changing hands rapidly. Abigail's heart sank as Henry's eyes lit up upon spotting her. He waved her over, his enthusiasm palpable even from across the dingy tavern. Well, well, what have we here? Henry called out, his voice carrying over the low murmur of the crowd. A fine lady gracing our humble establishment. Come, my dear, try your luck. Abigail hesitated feeling Rosemary's small hand tighten on her skirt. She knew this game all too well, having seen Henry run it countless times before. With an internal sigh, she realised she had little choice but to play along if she wanted any hope of speaking to him privately. I'm not sure, sir, Abigail said, affecting a timid demeanour as she approached the table. I've never gambled before. Henry's eyes twinkled with mischief as he lifted his chin, fractionally. 
a tacit acknowledgement that she was playing along. Nonsense! You look like an honest woman with lady luck on her side. Come now, just a small wager to start. What do you say? Abigail felt Rosemary's questioning gaze on her face but didn't dare look down at the girl. Instead, she fumbled in her pocket, pulling out a few coins with exaggerated nervousness. Well, I suppose a small bet couldn't hurt, she said, her voice wavering just enough to sound uncertain. Henry beamed, gesturing grandly to the makeshift gaming table before him. That's the spirit. Now, ladies and gentlemen, watch closely. The game is simple. As Henry launched into his spiel, Abigail caught his eye once more. The sidelong glance he gave her spoke volumes. She knew her role in this charade, and as much as she hated it, she'd play her part. It was the only way to ensure she'd get a moment alone with him later. With practised ease, Abigail allowed herself to be drawn into the game, her apparent beginner's luck drawing gasps and cheers from the crowd. Abigail slipped away from the gaming table, her heart racing. She grabbed Rosemary's hand and quickly made her way through the crowd, ignoring the disappointed groans behind her. The cool air outside was a relief after the stuffy tavern. Come on, she murmured to Rosemary, guiding her towards a nearby fishmonger's stall. The pungent smell of fish assaulted her nostrils as they approached. Abigail pretended to examine the glistening catch on display, her eyes darting frequently to the tavern door. What was that about? Rosemary whispered, her green eyes wide with curiosity. Abigail shook her head slightly. Not now, she breathed, picking up a fish and examining it with feigned interest. Minutes ticked by, feeling like hours. Abigail's fingers tapped nervously against her skirt as she waited, her mind racing with possibilities. What if Henry didn't come out? What if he'd been caught cheating? Just as she was about to give up hope, the tavern door creaked open. Henry sauntered out looking as nonchalant as ever. His eyes scanned the street before landing on Abigail. With a casual air, he strolled over to her, a sly grin playing on his lips. Fancy meeting you here, my dear, Henry said loudly as if they were mere acquaintances. He leaned in closer, lowering his voice. Quite the performance back there. You haven't lost your touch. Abigail forced a smile, her eyes never leaving the fish in her hands. I learned from the best, didn't I? She murmured back. Henry chuckled, reaching past her to pick up a fish himself. To anyone watching, they might have appeared to be nothing more than two customers haggling over the day's catch. Abigail set off along the docks at a leisurely pace her heart still pounding from the excitement in the tavern. Henry fell into step beside her, his gait casual but his eyes sharp, scanning their surroundings. On her other side, Rosemary clung close, her small form almost hidden behind Abigail's skirts. The girl had gone eerily quiet, a stark contrast to her earlier boldness. The salty air whipped around them, carrying the cries of gulls and the creaking of ship timbers. Abigail kept her voice low as she addressed Henry, mindful of potential eavesdroppers. Well done back there, Henry said once more, his tone light but his eyes serious. You've still got the touch, my dear. But I can't help but wonder what brings you down to these unsavoury parts. Surely not just to show off your skills at the gaming table. Abigail glanced at him sideways, weighing her words carefully. I find myself in need of a skilled actor. Henry chuckled, a sound that didn't quite reach his eyes. Ah, so it's business then. And here I thought you might have missed my charming company. Abigail allowed herself a small smile, memories of simpler times flashing through her mind. But she quickly pushed them aside, focusing on the task at hand. I imagine you've heard about the Duke of Newcastle, she asked, keeping her voice barely above a whisper. Henry's eyebrows shot up, surprise evident on his face. The Duke? Now that's an interesting query. What's your angle here, Abigail? Abigail hesitated, acutely aware of Rosemary's presence. The girl might be silent, but Abigail knew she was listening intently. 
Let's just say I've found myself in his employ and we've need of a household staff. Henry let out a low whistle. The Duke, eh? You're playing a dangerous game, my dear. It's one thing to toy with a baron or country knight, but this is something else entirely. Abigail shrugged, trying to appear unbothered. You know better than most that we've no control over the hand that life deals us. Too true, my little dove. Henry said casually. He readjusted his jacket as they passed a stand selling oranges fresh off the boats, palming one in a movement so smooth that even Abigail, used to his sleight of hand, had a hard time following it. Abigail shot Henry a disapproving look as he began peeling the orange, biting right into the sweet flesh. Some habits, it seemed, died hard. She sighed, shaking her head slightly, as Rosemary peered around her to stare at the orange as Henry ate. So, my dear, Henry said, ignoring her silent rebuke, what part am I to play in this little drama of yours? Something dashing and romantic, I hope. Abigail couldn't help but roll her eyes. We need a distinguished, polished footman, she replied, her tone matter-of-fact. Henry's face fell slightly, disappointment evident in the downturn of his mouth. A footman? Really, Abigail, that's hardly a role worthy of my considerable talents. Abigail allowed herself a small smile. Virgil's there too, she added, watching Henry's reaction closely. As expected, Henry's eyes lit up, a grin spreading across his face. Virgil? Well, now that changes things. It'll be nice to see the old brute again. We had some grand times together, didn't we? You'd better hope he's forgiven you for Bristol, Abigail pointed a yout, remembering the incident with a mixture of exasperation and amusement. Henry waved his hand dismissively, seemingly unconcerned. Oh, that? Ancient history, my dear. Virgil's not one to hold a grudge. Besides, it all worked out in the end, didn't it? Abigail raised an eyebrow, unconvinced. She knew Virgil better than that, and... While he might not hold a grudge forever, he certainly had a long memory for slights. Still, if anyone could charm their way back into Virgil's good graces, it was Henry. Abigail watched as Henry promised to appear at the Duke's house that afternoon, dressed for the part of a distinguished footman. As he turned to walk away, she caught a flash of orange in his hand. Another piece of fruit she hadn't even seen him steal. Her lips pressed into a thin line torn between exasperation and a reluctant admiration for his skill. Henry paused mid-stride, spinning back to face them with a roguish grin. You're collecting quite an eclectic household, aren't you, my dear? His eyes twinkled with mischief as they darted between Abigail and Rosemary. Before Abigail could respond, Henry's hand moved in a blur. The orange sailed through the air, arcing gracefully towards Rosemary. The girl's eyes widened in surprise, but her hand shot up instinctively, catching the fruit with ease. You'll need to build up strength and energy to keep up with this group of misfits, Henry called out, his gaze fixed on Rosemary. There was a hint of approval in his voice that made Abigail's chest tighten with an unexpected surge of protectiveness. Rosemary stared at the orange in her hands, then up at Henry her expression a mixture of wariness and curiosity. Abigail felt the girl press closer to her side, as if seeking reassurance. Henry? Abigail started, her tone warning, but he was already turning away, disappearing into the crowd with a final wave and a wink. Abigail sighed, shaking her head. She looked down at Rosemary, who was still clutching the orange, her knuckles white against the bright fruit. The girl looked up at Abigail as if waiting for permission. Abigail could feel one side of her mouth tugging up in a smile, and she nodded. That was all that Rosemary needed. The rest of their steps back to the Duke's house were marked by a trail of orange peel and droplets of juice. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the full book. The full audiobook will be available on YouTube in a few days. What did you like the most? Comment below and share this video on your social media and with your friends. Watch one of the following videos.
Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.